this course on accelerator physics. So this is module 2 of uh, the course on accelerator physics in which uh, I will be covering about uh, linear accelerators. So you have already studied about uh, DC accelerators where acceleration is done using DC fields. Now we will study about um, uh, RF accelerators where acceleration is done using time varying or RF fields. So this module consists of uh, 13 lectures and uh, let's get started with the first lecture which is uh, basically introduction and some basic concepts that you will be requiring during this course. Um, listed here is the references that I will be using. So the first book RF linear accelerators I will be using this book widely. Uh, this is by Thomas Wangler. The other books that I will be using are Accelerator Physics by S. Y. Lee, uh, Particle Accelerator Physics by Helmut Weidman, then Introduction to Accelerator Physics by Arvind Chan and uh, for the super, Superconducting Accelerators portion, I will be referring to these two books, RF Superconductivity for Accelerators and RF Superconductivity by Hassan Badakshi. In addition to these, you can also refer to the uh, proceedings of the CERN Accelerator School and the US Particle Accelerator School which is available by uh, online. So these, um, I have already given here the websites where you can refer to. These schools have been running for various years and they have lot of uh, good um, information on accelerator physics. So you can use this also. So here is the basic outline of the course on uh, linear accelerators. So first I will be giving you an introduction and basic concepts. Then we learn about RF acceleration that is how acceleration is done using RF fields. Then how these uh, RF fields are generated in Lennard cavities. So basically we use the electric fields associated with the electromagnetic waves in the cavity. So for that we learn about electromagnetic waves, the propagation, their propagation in free space between two parallel conducting planes, waveguides and cavities. We learn about different accelerating structures from the simple pillbox cavity to the drift tube lenac and the complex radio frequency quadrupole accelerator. We will also learn how acceleration can be done using travelling waves as well as standing waves. Having learned all the accelerating structures, we learn about the dynamics of the beams in the transverse direction that is transverse in the direction of propagation of the um, beam and then their dynamics in the longitudinal direction and then uh, finally about superconductivity in Linux. So let's start with some basic definitions. The charge particle acceleration basically means to increase the kinetic energy of the charge particles by the application of an electric field. Why and only electric field that we will understand in a moment. So we accelerate charge particle beams in the accelerator. What is a charge particle beam? So basically it is uh, an ensemble of charge particles that satisfies the following conditions. Not all collection of charge particles can be called a beam. Only those collection of charge particles that satisfies the following conditions can be uh, is known as a beam. So the particles in the beams they should have high kinetic energies as compared to the thermal energies. So all particles have some thermal energies. So uh, to qualify as a beam the kinetic energy of the beam should be quite high as compared to the thermal energy. The spread in kinetic energy of the charged particles is small. So basically let's say if you have a collection of charged particles and one particle is at 10 MeV another at 5 MeV and uh, another at 10 MeV. This again does not qualify as a beam because there is a huge spread in the kinetic energy of the charged particles. To qualify as a beam, the spread in the kinetic energies should be very small. Finally, the beam particles, they move in one direction with limited extent in the transverse direction. So let's say this is a beam and uh, it is uh, propagating in the Z direction which is a direction coming out of your screen. So the x direction and in the y direction the velocities of the particles so Vx and Vy okay so these should be very very small as compared to the velocity in the z direction. So they should have limited extent in the transverse direction to the direction of propagation of the V then it qualifies as a V. <coughs> 
So you must have already studied about classification of accelerators. Let me just uh, list it down here again for completeness. So basically accelerators are classified based on uh, their uh, the way the uh, they are the charged particles are accelerated. So DC accelerators use uh, DC fields for acceleration. RF accelerators use RF fields for acceleration or time varying fields for acceleration. Okay, so DC accelerators basically you generate high voltage. So some methods of generating high voltage are Cockcroft, Walton, Van de Graaff, Pelletron, etc., which you must have already studied in module one. RF accelerators are further classified into circular accelerators and linear accelerators depending upon the path taken by the charged particles during acceleration. So when charged particles move in circular paths, they are circular or spiral paths, they are known as circular accelerators and when they move in a straight line, they are known as linear accelerators. Module 3 will cover the circular accelerators. Some examples of circular accelerators are microtron, betatron, cyclotron, synchrocyclotron, synchrotron, etc. And some examples of uh, linear accelerators which you will study during this course are the drift tube linear, the coupled cavity drift tube linear, the RFQ, etc. So, as I said, linear accelerators or linear, they are de devices that accelerate charged particles in a single line. Energy gain in a DC field. So the simplest way to accelerate a charged particle is acceleration in a DC field. So you simply generate a DC field, apply it between uh, two plates, okay, and then you have a charged particle. It sees this potential difference. It sees this electric field. The force acting on the charged particle is simply force is equal to Q into the electric field. Here uh, Q denotes N into E. So N is the total charge state. So let's say for example, you have copper two positive. So here N is equal to two, okay, because your force acting as well as the energy gain will also depend upon what is the charge state. And E is simply the electronic charge, which is 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. So energy gain of a charge particle in the electric field generated by potential V is simply delta W is equal to Q into V. V is the potential difference. Typically, the unit used here is electron volts and the relation between electron volts and joule is 1 electron volt is 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. If you want to, uh, if you want to talk in terms of higher energies, use, uh, so 1000 electron volt is kilo electron volt and then you have million electron volt, giga electron volt and tera electron volt. So the highest energy to which particles have been accelerated so far is 7 TV. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN accelerates charged particles to 7 TV. So that's the maximum energy to which the charged particles have been accelerated. Okay, so why, why do we talk in terms of electron volt? Why not joule? Because in our daily life, we use joule. So just to give you an idea about the numbers, <coughs> Let's see here, the energy to raise a 100 gram object by 1 meter. Okay, if you can calculate this, this will come out to be 0.1 kilogram into the acceleration due to gravity. Let me take it as 10 meters per second square multiplied by the distance uh, 1 meter. So this comes out to be 1 joule. Okay, and this number, if I convert it into TV, it's a huge number. Okay, remember the maximum energy to which uh, charged particle has been accelerated is 70 TV. So this is much, much greater than that. Okay. Okay. Again, now let's see the energy to power a 100 watt bulb for just 1.6 nanoseconds. That is 1 TV. Okay. So these numbers, which in our daily life we use. So compared to that, if you see the uh, energies of the charge particle, so they are huge. So you can calculate the energy of the proton traveling with a velocity almost close to the velocity of light. Okay, So that is 5.7 GeV which is only 9.1 into 10 to the power of minus 12 joules. Okay, So it's, it's, it's quite a small number. Okay, However, when we are talking of a beam, the beam, uh, the bunch of a beam in an accelerator has large number of particles Okay, of the order of 10 to the power of 10 to, the, uh, to 10 to the power of 12. So total beam power is very high. Okay, so here the velocities 
to which we are accelerating is very high okay however the mass of the charged particles is quite low as compared to objects in our daily life so that is why their energies may appear to be smaller than that compared to what we use in our daily life so joule is too big a number to denote the energies of uh, these particles hence we use electron volt here okay so why do we need to go to rf accelerators because dc accelerators have certain disadvantages the maximum energy in the dc accelerator is limited by the maximum voltage that can be generated okay so the energy gain depends upon how high a voltage you can produce and sustain so it is this is limited maximum you can go to maybe just about 20 to 30 million volts in a dc accelerator also this high voltage generated you cannot use it more than once or twice as in the case of tandem accelerator okay so you cannot use this uh, this voltage generated again and again so it's not possible to have a circular dc accelerator okay let's say you generated a dc voltage okay so you've applied some potential difference okay of uh, v and uh, you've generated a electric field the charged particle sees this field and this is the energy gain okay and now if you would say that let me bend this and bring it back again and accelerate it again it's not possible because you see that the dc accelerators they use electrostatic fields for acceleration and electrostatic field is a conservative field so if you uh, you see from maxwell's equation curl of e is zero or integral of e dot dl is zero that means it is the uh, this is independent of the path taken it depends only on the initial and final coordinates okay so if i gain some energy delta w here in going back here i will again lose that energy so there will be no net energy gain and it does not matter if i go back to this point in this manner or in this manner okay so the field generated by a uh dc voltage cannot be used more than once for acceleration or twice in the case of as in the case of tandem accelerator okay so it's not possible to accelerate charge particles to very high energies using dc accelerators so what is the solution the solution is to use an rf accelerator the rf accelerator uses time varying electric fields for acceleration of charged particles so if you see the electromagnetic spectrum okay the uh, so this is the uh, this is the frequency okay and the frequencies used for acceleration they lie in this range typically from few megahertz to tens of gigahertz and this uh, lies in the radio frequency region okay so that is why this is known as a rf accelerator so it's using time varying Uh, electric fields for acceleration and since the frequency lies in the radio frequency region it is known as rf accelerators and as you have already seen there are two ways two types of uh, accelerators rf accelerators one is a circular accelerator the other is the linear accelerator so the circular accelerators the charged particles move in a circular or spiral path whereas in a linear accelerator they move in a linear path in the circular accelerator the same voltage can be used multiple times for acceleration okay so you can have uh, a circular accelerator and you can have a accelerating cavity here you can keep bending you can keep bending the particles and bringing it back here again and again so the same voltage generated can be used again and again the fields are time varying so uh, the field is no longer conservative okay so uh, unlike the dc accelerator you can use this voltage again and again for acceleration the linear accelerator on the other hand it's a single pass machine the charge particles will pass through it for a single time okay the voltage generated here is used only once for acceleration okay <clears throat> the circular accelerators cannot handle very high beam currents whereas the linear accelerators they can handle very high beam currents as well as they can run in high duty cycle so we'll learn uh, uh, about the duty cycle in this course the circular accelerators they exhibit synchrotron radiation losses so when charged particles 
they bend they emit a radiation known as synchrotron radiation so these synchrotron radiation cause loss in energy which has to be compensated in the accelerator since there is no bending involved in the linear accelerator so uh, there is no losses due to synchrotron radiation in the circular accelerator since charged particles are moving in a circular path so the extraction becomes difficult whereas extraction is simpler in a linear accelerator so circular accelerators they require lesser cavities because you can uh, use the same cavity again and again whereas uh, the linear accelerators require large number of cavities so this makes linear accelerators expensive and they need more space whereas circular accelerators are less expensive and need less space so the large hadron collider at cern that i was talking about which accelerates charged particle to 7 tv so it has a circumference of 27 kilometers okay so you can imagine that if it was a linear accelerator how long it would have been so when you building very large energy accelerators it is better to go for circular accelerators so some examples of circular accelerators are cyclotron synchrotron and uh, some examples of linear accelerators are dtl rfq etc linear accelerators have various applications okay so they range from small accelerators to huge accelerators so and they are widely used for a variety of applications okay the main applications are medical applications so yeah they here they are used both for therapy so that means treatment of uh, cancer using x ray radiography and proton uh, or ion radiography and uh, for diagnostics so there are certain they are used to produce certain uh, isotopes which can be used for the diagnosis of diseases mainly cancer they have various industrial applications okay so in the uh, irradiation of food to improve the shelf life then sterilization then they are also injectors to large synchrotron accelerators and spallation neutron sources so uh, the large hadron collider so it's a synchrotron it's a circular accelerator but the inject injector to the uh, injector to the uh synchrotron is actually a linear accelerator so you start with a linear accelerator and then inject it into a synchrotron they are also used for accelerator driven systems which i'll talk about in a moment so x ray radiography so here is a uh, here is a picture of a uh, linac the electron linac it hits a target and uh, here x rays are produced these x rays are then used to irradiate the uh, cancerous tumor in the patient's body and uh, kill the cancerous cell so these are used in several hospitals for treatment of cancer so nowadays uh, proton and ion therapy is also gaining a uh, lot of uh, importance for uh, treatment the advantage of proton therapy or ion therapy is that if you see the depth dose curve so if you if you see for x rays you see that initially it is high and then the dose decreases as the depth increases okay so this is for different energies of x rays similar for electrons so electrons the electrons deposit all the energy in, in at just a few centimeter depth of the tissue however if you see the depth dose curve for the proton beam we see that initially the um, dose is very less and then it suddenly peaks and then again goes to zero so this is an advantage where your uh, tumor is lying deep inside the body so let's see here for example there is a tumor here and if you irradiate it by x rays so here the healthy tissues are also getting irradiated and then the cancer cells are uh, destroyed and then the healthy tissues here again they get irradiated so lot of healthy tissues are irradiated which is undesirable whereas if you use the proton therapy or you can use some ion uh, beam also here the advantage is that it will deposit all the uh, dose here so and the uh, depth of this peak which is known as the bragg's peak can be changed by changing the energy of the uh proton or ion beam so you see that it is uh, this is very advantageous and uh, uh, it is now being used for uh, treat, uh, treatment of cancer because of the advantages that it offers so in india we have one such machine at the apollo hospital in chennai and many more are coming up 
then as i said uh, they are also used for diagnostics so here they are used for the production of isotopes for uh, positron emission tomography so this is a diagnostic technique for finding out the location of a cancerous tumor so uh, we use accelerators to produce these isotopes which are listed here okay so uh, these are all positron emitters and uh, they have very short half lives so fluorine if you see it has 110 minutes so what is done is that this isotope along with the uh, glucose in the form of fdg is injected into the patient's body and uh, so this glucose has a tendency that it is tumor seeking so it goes and sits into the tumor and uh, at the location of the tumor let's say here the fluorine 18 in uh, the fluorine 18 here it will emit positron and there are a lot of free electrons around here so this positron will immediately combine with the uh, elect free electron here and the uh, annihilation reaction will take place emitting two gamma in the opposite direction there is a series of detectors here which can simultaneously detect these uh, gamma and from this the exact location of this tumor can be pinpointed so this is a very useful technique for uh, diagnosis of tumors so uh, these are the uh, isotopes that are generally used for uh, for the diagnostic then there are lots of uh, industrial applications sterilization sterilization of medical devices food pasteurization then uh, cross linking of polymers to improve their strength environment remediation so there is the sludge water treatment to make it uh, germ free and bacteria free then uh, electron beam induced crystal defect so coloring of gemstones you can actually change the color of the gemstones by treatment with uh, Uh, radiation from an accelerator then uh, radiation processing of foods okay so it helps in sprout inhibition so you can it improves the shelf life then uh, hygienization delay in ripening okay so wide variety of applications are there for the accelerators <clears throat> then they are also used uh, as cargo scanners so these are the uh, uh, these are the cargo containers which are huge in size and uh, if they have to be inspected manually it would take a large amount of time so they have to be scanned in a very short time typically about a minute so we have uh, we have here uh, uh, electron accelerators and then uh, they hit a target and x rays are produced and uh, these x rays they can scan through the uh, they can very quickly scan through the cargo container and reveal its objects so in this picture for example you can see that the declared uh, declared object was uh, something else here but inside it was actually used for smuggling humans so it, it's very useful uh, way to scan these cargo containers in a very short amount of 